Alfonso Cuaron's Roma, a dual male departure alters a family's world. In the early 1970s in the district Roma of Mexico City, the boyfriend of Cleo, the housekeeper, abandons her and their unborn baby, while the man for whom she works forsakes Sofia, the household's matriarch, and his four young children. Faced with these desertions, the women do not collapse but persevere, banding together to steal the bonds of their overlooked community. Cuaron looks over this community, artistically preserving those who persevere. Largely autobiographical, the film, according to Cuaron, is an intimate portrait of the women who raised him, and a recognition of love as a mystery that transcends space, memory, and time. The film pays special homage to Liberia Rodriguez, Libo for short, the indigenous Mistec nanny who joined his family in his infancy, and who inspired the character Cleo. Libo, also Cleo, is hardly the figure her machismo loving society reveres, such as society renders her, a lower-class woman tasked with menial labor, negligible. In contrast to this society, Cuaron's film not only acknowledges her, but also centers her. With his cinematic camera, he patiently pays attention to this patient woman, adopting a lens of artistic compassion that she herself practiced, taught, and inspired. In Cuaron's remembered world, the last come first. In this essay, I'm going to show how Quaron combines Christian iconography with a narrative of women's perseverance to articulate a convergence of time and eternity, and to posit a notion of women's cinema as world cinema. This argument pivots around the image of the plane that bookends the film, a crossed and crossing image that suggests both God and the global. The film, which Quaron created for Libo, and which he described as a ghost of the present visiting the past, communicates a vision in which those who act with love are preserved, while those who reject love write themselves out of the story. This self-genesis of the artwork bears implications for auteur theory, whereby we can rethink the notion of the cinematic auteur not as a solitary genius, but as a genius in communion with the world who gives rise to the auteur, as much as the auteur gives rise to the world. Quaron has created a somewhat eclectic group of films, including Children of Men, Gravity, and the best Harry Potter film. Among his films, he perhaps qualifies most as auteur in Roma. Filling most of the major production roles, he is the film's writer, director, director of photography, co-editor, and co-producer. He used memory as the primary creative method, gathering memories from himself and from conversations with Libo, and then recreating them with remarkable precision. These precisely remembered details manifest, for example, in a facsimile of his childhood home in the clothes the neighbors wear, in the toys with which the children play, and in the cars and even the leaves that fill the street. Quaron even went so far as to cast near doppelgangers, many of them first-time actors, of their real-life counterparts. His production process was intensely private. In order to maintain his desired stream of consciousness, creative process, he shared his notes with no one and only showed parts of the script to his cast on the days they filmed. On the day they filmed the scene in which the father walks out on the family, Quaron had to walk off set, suddenly overwhelmed by accessing the emotional space of the man whose departure left a wound on his own childhood. While the film is highly personal, it is not subjective. Though Quaron writes himself into the film, he is one of the older boys, his character is peripheral rather than protagonist. We don't see the world through his eyes, and Quaron as auteur establishes his authorship, as we will see, by giving authority through attention to Cleo. The film's style, too, shirks subjectivity. Using techniques like slow pacing in the pan, the film looks at the world, according to Quaron, objectively without getting involved, just observing, not trying to make a judgment or a comment commentary. Everything there is just the commentary itself. This objectivity also emerges through the film's use of black and white. The black and white palette, while signaling a remembered world, refuses sentimentality. As Quaron writes, I didn't want a film that looks vintage, that looks old. I wanted to do a modern film that looks into the past. It's not a vintage black and white, it's a contemporary black and white. Whereas a grainy vintage look might evoke nostalgia and longing, the sleek contemporary look that the film utilizes suggests calm curiosity and open-minded attention. The film opens with a consideration of the worldliness of the world. Worldliness in the sense of materiality, in dialogue with spirituality. Quaron has addressed this dialogue. We try to honor fire, wind, water, and earth. At the same time, we try to also acknowledge stuff like heaven and earth. The film starts by looking at earth, in which heaven is nothing but a reflection through the water. In a bird's eye view shot, we look down for quite a while at the ground, first bare and then bathed in water, before tilting up to see a laboring Cleo. Immediately we associate water, an 
important motif through the film, with her, we follow her, and for a full six minutes before dialogue even begins, we watch her at work through a series of pan shots, one of Quaron's favorite camera movements in this film. This introduction to Cleo and her cinematic world teaches us, the viewers, to patiently observe what we encounter, including the mundane details and menial tasks that captivate the camera, and that the film teaches us to read as profound. The world that Quaron constructs constitutes a culturally and historically specific web from which characters cannot unentangle themselves. As Quaron has said, time and space constrain us, but they also define who we are, creating inexplicable bonds with others that flow with us at the same time and through the same places. This element of constraint, or what characters see as constraint, and how subsequently they react to it, drives the film's action. Two characters in particular attempt to flee from their circumstances, Antonio, the father of the four children, and Fermin, the love interest of Cleo. Let's focus first on Antonio. Much of the film's action takes place in and around the family's home, and while viewers can readily see the beauty of the house and of the people who occupy it, Antonio experiences it as a claustrophobic space. When we first see him arriving home from a business trip, we don't really see him right away. As he carefully pulls his car into the narrow driveway, the cinematic gaze bends to his priorities. We get a series of close-ups of parts of the car and of his cigarette, and music plays to drown out the family that waits for him near the door. He takes a deep breath as if suffocating, his car rolls over dog crap, and once in, he takes his time meeting the family who greets him. While home, he doesn't allow himself to feel at home, and he complains about the messiness of the house, which we see under Cleo's and Adela's care is nearly spotless. It is no surprise to us when he leaves again, this time without the intention to return. At the moment of his departure, his wife tries to convince him to come back, while Cleo and his youngest son, Pepe, watch in the background. Meanwhile, military music sounds off screen, reminding us that this film's action occurs against the backdrop of Mexican Revolution. This revolution comes to the forefront through Fermin, who takes up martial arts to escape the slums and bad relations. We certainly come to dislike him for the inexcusable way he treats Cleo, while acknowledging that the film, committed to a non-judgmental attitude, does reveal him, at times ridiculous and at times cruel, as a product of circumstance. We get a glimpse into his neighborhood, we see the version of manhood that his society promotes, and we do get a sense that the backstory he tells Cleo is true, although clearly he uses it as leverage to get laid. At first news of her pregnancy, he abandons her, and later when she confronts him, he threatens her. The pair is one final confrontation on the day of the Corpus Christi Massacre, when Fermin encounters Cleo in a furniture store, and again, he flees. We find occurrences of the plane motif, which is established in the film's first scene, during instances of male departure. Right before Sophia tells her children that their father has left the family, we see a toy plane resting on the table. Cleo tells Fermin of her pregnancy inside a cinema that plays the end of a 1966 French-British film, wherein the characters fly planes to safety. Read according to these two instances, the planes represent male escape from situations they deem oppressive. Situations in which the women, whether due to bodily or economic constraints, remain enmeshed. But the planes represent more than male flight. In the mentioned instances about Antonio's and Fermin's departures, we can also read the planes in relation to the women's resilience. In the face of the pain she and her children feel, Sophia casts the fatherless next chapter in the children's lives as an exciting adventure. Cleo, faced with Fermin's desertion and worried she'll lose the job she needs, never wavers from her disposition of calm strength and we fittingly hear the sound of another plane when she visits the doctor for her pregnancy. Furthermore, through the motif of the plane, the film associates the women's resilience with the eternal. The connection of the plane to heavenly matters occurs in one instance through Pepe's recounting of a past life. He tells Cleo that he was a fighter pilot, a detail that associates the plane with reincarnation. Most significantly, the association among the plain, heaven, and human resilience occurs when Cleo finds herself among a field of martial artists. Multiple planes fly overhead as the leader discusses the union of matter and spirit. El desarrollo mental es el motor al desarrollo físico. He himself masters this union, performing a feat that few can accomplish, a seemingly simple balancing act. As he balances, a plane flies overhead as his body creates a triangle of light. 
Meanwhile, the others attempt the act, and all fail. All that is, except Cleo. On the outskirts of the group, Cleo balances perfectly, but unlike as with the group's leader, no one notices Cleo. No one, that is, except the camera. We witness this feat, and then quickly move on, to see Cleo horribly insulted and threatened by Fermine. What Fermine and the others fail to see, and what the film bids us to see through its gentle attention, is Cleo's strength, as incredible as it is quiet. The film shows us that Cleo is as powerful as water, which she at once reflects and commands. As perhaps the most important motif in the film, water leaks into every dimension of the cinematic world, always in association with Cleo. Right away we see her use water for her chores, cleaning up the mess of others, which she does figuratively as well. And in the hotel room, we see Cleo sit by a painting of the sea, hung crookedly on the wall, while Fermin gives a self-absorbed performance. Repeatedly, we see people's need for water, whether to quench a forest fire during a New Year's celebration, or to demand it for sustenance. Water and politics converge again when, on the day of the Corpus Christi massacre, Cleo's water breaks, right after the moment when Fermine holds her at gunpoint, then flees. At the hospital, she gives birth to a stillborn daughter. In this moment, it is almost as if Cleo embodies the community that surrounds her and yokes together their suffering. The association between Cleo and water culminates during the beach scene in which she saves the children. Before the rescue, the scene establishes the immense power of the waves. We see them crashing against the land, and Sophia warns the children not to swim out too far, as Cleo cannot swim. Right before the children need help, Pepe, with his proclivity for reincarnation stories, recounts how he once was a sailor who drowned to his death. This threat recurs when the children nearly drown. Although Cleo cannot swim, she moves steadily through the water, maintaining her stamina as each powerful wave crashes against her. She succeeds at her rescue, and back on shore, the family shares a seaside embrace. Notice how the group forms a triangle of light. We've seen this illuminative geometry before, during the balancing act of the martial arts leader, who spoke of mind-body unity. Here we find the same unity, or incarnation, on a larger scale. The heavens of the sky and of the sunlight meet the sand, water, and family. At this opportune moment, Cleo confesses her truth that she did not want her baby, and the others tell her they love her and hold her at the center of their embrace. The centering image of Cleo and the family articulates the film's central theme, a recognition of love as a mystery that transcends space, memory, and time. This mystery of love, through which time and eternity inexplicably meet, preserves those who love through storytelling and art. During the scene in which Sophia conveys Antonio's leaving, one of the children asks, doesn't he love us anymore? This question significantly runs up against comments about books. Sophia tells the children that she took new work at a publishing house, and that she loves books. She also tells them the reason for their vacation. Their father wanted to retrieve from the house his belongings, including the bookshelves. Notably, the bookshelves, but not the books. When the family returns, we see he followed up on his intention. With no shelves on which to stand, books rest stacked on the floor. This detail, as with Antonio's earlier focus on his car over his family, signals again that he prizes appearances over substance. But it also bears greater significance when we consider the role storytelling plays in this film and especially in the final sequence. The rooms have changed and the children remark on the movement from the old to the new, a detail that signifies they have entered a new chapter of life, a new adventure, as Sophia says. Then they settled down by their grandmother, to whom they recount the tale of Cleo's rescue. As they relay the remembered story, they actively write the next page of their life story. If their father is not in this next portion, it is because he has effectively written himself out of the story. The film's gaze, as Quaron has said, is not judgmental, but it does give attention where attention is due. While the characters forge their future, traces of the past remain, and we see Cleo as she was at the film's beginning, performing chores. After Adela tells her she wants to hear everything about the trip, Cleo ascends the stairs, carrying laundry to the roof. The vision above echoes but alters the opening shot. Whereas we had initially looked down at water that reflected the sky and a plane, we now look up and directly at the sky and another plane. This alteration, I want to argue, uses the Hail Mary prayer as framework. This is not to say that the film touts a Christian religiosity, such would be problematic, to say the least, given the country's colonial history, but that it nonetheless uses Christian iconography, no doubt integral to Cuaron's own boyhood in Mexico City, as a vessel to meditate on matters of time, eternity, and community, and to elevate its protagonist, namely Cleo, to the level of an author of the auteur himself.
At one point in the film, we hear this prayer. Mrs. Teresa prays the Hail Mary while she and a laboring Cleo wait in traffic. Let's for a moment think of this prayer as a poem. We can break the prayer poem into two sections. In the first four lines, whose words echo those of the angel Gabriel during the Annunciation, and those of her relative Elizabeth during the Visitation, the speaker looks down at Mary. In the final four lines, we get a perspectival shift. Now the speaker looks up at Mary, acknowledging her as the heavenly queen, and asking for her help for those beneath her. Roma enacts this same perspectival shift. We begin with a bird's eye view, or God's eye view, looking down at Cleo and her work, and we end by gazing up at her and the sky through which a plane flies. Cleo is creature-turned-creator, whose life, in what Quaron rightfully calls a mystery, yokes together eternity and time, heaven and earth. The plane, which resembles a cross, emphasizes the prayerful connection, and it communicates both God and the global. Though the film's women are confined to the familial responsibilities from which the film's men flee, it is ultimately the women whose story is preserved, recreated, and carried on through Coron's film. Patricia White writes, Women's cinema should always be seen as world cinema, and indeed Quaron establishes this connection. His film transports the women who raised him beyond their spatio-temporal circumstances and delivers them to a global audience, and this audience, in turn, is transported to the world that Quaron has so carefully crafted. This craftsmanship, as Quaron emphasizes, arises not from his own solitary genius, but from the family that reared him. True, Quaron as godly auteur creates Cleo, looking down down at her at the start, designating her as the one who will embody and articulate, indeed who will incarnate, the film's central concerns. But by the end, we see Cleo recast as the film's queen and creator of Quaron and his film. Quaron pays homage to his cinematic mother by both looking at her and by adopting her way of looking. After all, might not the camera's gentle and patient gaze echo Cleo's way of living in and envisioning the world? It is this vision, a vision of a remarkable woman, of ongoing love, and of preserved perseverance that Quaron's film communicates and carries to the world.